and the Madelines of America are worth it. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Alabama. Uh, the remarks by the Senator from Oklahoma are very interesting and telling. And I listened to him carefully. And I believe basically he is right on the point. Uh, I believe basically that we all agree with the Senator that it is important to reduce the waste and duplication in our government. And he points out a lot of it. GAO has done it, too. Uh, our staff has met with the GAO several times on ways to address this problem. We know the problem. We've got to act on it. And we've got to take it very seriously. And uh, GAO, as Senator Coburn said, is coming out with a new report. But if we, if we work on this, the government was, is going to be more efficient, and we're going to save money, and we're going to respond to problems in America much better. We're a long way from doing this, and I appreciate his remarks this afternoon, and I hope that a lot of this, my senators were looking at that and listening to it. Madam President. Senator from Nebraska. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to speak about uh, 12 minutes as in uh, morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. I rise today to uh, discuss a bill my colleagues and I introduced to reestablish Trade Promotion Authority, often referred to as TPA. Senators Baucus and Hatch, along with Congressman Camp in the House, introduced the Congressional Trade Priorities Act just last week. The Senate Finance Committee held a hearing on it uh, today. This bill would resurrect the partnership between Congress and the administration to promote a robust trade agenda. That partnership, known as TPA, came about as a way to thoughtfully and pragmatically exercise Congress's constitutional authority to regulate foreign commerce. TPA effectively combines this authority with the President's authority to negotiate treaties. Congress, therefore, provides the marching orders to the President, and the President, in turn, gets an up or down vote on the agreement that is negotiated. So, Madam President, some might ask, why would we do this? Why should Congress set rules for itself to consider trade agreements through a very special legislative process? Well, simply put, negotiating modern trade agreements would be virtually impossible without providing some assurance that agreed upon provisions, negotiated provisions, won't be picked apart after the negotiators shake hands. Trade ag agreements span a multitude of issues affecting international commerce. To reach these agreements, they need to be extensive. There needs to be extensive negotiations by representatives of the countries involved. But Congress is hardly equipped to engage in multilateral negotiations with foreign countries. We know that. We can hardly negotiate with each other these days. TPA allows Congress to set priorities for trade agreements and engage with the President throughout the process. During floor considerations, amendments cannot be offered because it would undermine our trade representative. It would undermine the trade representative's hand in negotiation. So imagine, Madam President, our negotiators signing a deal, shaking hands with our counterparts from other parts of the world, and then bringing the deal to Congress. Then, after 535 people offer a whole slew of amendments, they have to go back to the other countries and try to reopen negotiations because everything has been changed. No one would ever negotiate a trade deal with the United States again. So why is that a bad thing? Should we negotiate trade agreements at all? 
I would argue unquestionably the answer is absolutely yes. White Houses from Reagan to Obama would agree with that. Furthermore, the overall benefit of, benefit of free trade is undisputed by the economists. A free rules-based trading system is much better for America than a system where the government picks winners and losers. And it's better for American jobs when the playing field is a level playing field. Let me give you an example, Colombia. In 2011, Congress passed a trade agreement with Colombia, already one of our most important allies in Latin America. Now that trade relationship is thriving as a result of that agreement. Consider this. Between 2011 and 2013, U.S. goods exports to Colombia have increased 18 percent. At the same time, U.S. goods exports to the rest of the world have decreased by 2 percent. Trade agreements are a great benefit to Americans as well as in corners of the world where they need a strong ally. Unfortunately, that's a message that doesn't always make it through. Instead, we hear a chorus of scare tactics about job losses, environmental concerns, whatever it is. Critics ignore the proven power of trade to expand job opportunities and to improve standard of living, not only here, but around the world. At the same time, the lives of millions of people around the world improve. Almost all economists would agree that countries should move toward more free trade, not less. One need only examine tariff rates to understand why it's in our best interest to pursue trade agreements. U.S. barriers to trade are already very low by global standards. Our average tariff rate is 3.5 percent. Compare, compare that to our current trade negotiating partners. Vietnam has an average tariff rate of 10 percent. Malaysia's average is 6 percent. Japan and the EU, EU both have average tariff rates of 5.3 percent. Only New Zealand has a lower rate than we do. So trade agreements help to level the playing field by bringing down tariffs imposed on our goods by our competitors. Put simply, trade agreements knock down barriers. They open up doors for U.S. producers and manufacturers to get our economic engine going again. Critics falsely claim we're going to experience a flood of cheap imports as a result of new trade. My friends, that simply doesn't make sense when our tariffs are already low. Trade agreements bring down our competitors' high tariffs. They level the playing field. The benefit to trade is especially clear for agricultural products, huge drivers of the economy in my state. Our average tariff on these imported products is 5 percent. Malaysia's is 11 percent. The European Union is 14 percent. Vietnam is 17 percent. Japan has an agricultural tariff rate of 23 percent. And these countries all already have a number of trade agreements in place with other countries. That means we face restrictions while our competitors reap the benefits of the open market. We're on the sidelines while other countries are filling the orders and creating the jobs. Trade Promotion Authority paves the way to lowering these barriers and in some cases eliminating them altogether. Of course, tariffs are not the only barriers our exporters face, and TPA would help us address the others, too. Countries also impose non-tariff barriers, often claiming some illegitimate basis in science, and they have brought our industries to their knees. Modern trade agreements address those barriers as well, and we can't get good trade agreements inked without TPA. In general, the U.S. abides by true science-based trade standards. This is less common, though, in the rest of the world, to say the least. Trade agreements help bring export markets in line with the same kind of science-based standards 
that we apply to our imports. So if you're concerned about foreign countries blocking American exports, you should support TPA. Without TPA, it becomes much, much harder to open up those markets for American workers. We should all get behind this TPA bill and get it across the finish line so that new trade agreements can clear the way for more Americans to be hired as export demand increases. I am pleased that President Obama now recognizes the immense benefit that trade provides to our great nation. Despite being all talk and no action on trade early on, this administration is currently negotiating the two largest trade agreements in history. In my opinion, it's time for the partisan bickering to end. There are clear job creating benefits to our country. And it's time for the President to make that case to the American people and to his allies in Congress. In a couple of weeks, the President will have an opportunity to do so on the State of the Union Address. I hope he follows through. Given the ambition of potential agreements across the Pacific and the Atlantic, the President must lay the groundwork, the vision, for the passage of this legislation. Creating jobs in this nation is too important to leave at the mercy of electioneer politics. It really is time to act. So my hope is that we pass TPA quickly so we can put Americans back to work. Madam Chair, thank you. I yield the floor. Uh, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. President. Senator from Alabama. Uh, is the Senate in quorum call? Yes, we are. I would ask consent that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam President, our late colleague, Senator Byrd, like to say there have been two great Senates in the United States in, in the history of the world, the U.S. Senate and the Roman Senate. He understood the special and crucial role the Senate fulfills in our constitutional republic. The Senate is where the great issues of our time are supposed to be examined, reviewed, and discussed before the whole nation in public. Yet in the last few years, we've witnessed the dramatic erosion of senators' rights and the dismantling of open process. We fund the government through massive omnibus bills. This is the bill that's before us now, 1,583 pages uh, stacked up here before us. Uh, and that no one really has a chance to read or evaluate or analyze. Senators are stripped of their rights to offer amendments. We won't have amendments. 
builds a rush through under threat of panic, crisis, or shutdown. Pass it today, or the government shuts down. Secret deals rule the day. Work is done outside the public, and millions of Americans are essentially robbed of their ability to participate in the process by examining what their senators do. Pop, uh, that's what they do. Under the tenure of, of Majority Leader Reid, the Senate is rapidly losing its historic role as that great deliberative body. If this continues, America will have lost something very precious. One of the tactics by which Majority Leader Reid has suppressed senators' rights and blocked open debate is the technique called filling the tree. What this means basically is that when a bill comes to the floor, the leader will use his right of first recognition uh, to fill all the available amendment slots on a bill and then block anyone else from offering an amendment. One man stands in the way of his 99 colleagues. I say one man, but not really all alone does he stand there. Uh, his power exists as long, only as long as his Democratic colleagues support his blocking of amendments. So this prevents the body from working its will. It prevents legislation from being improved by amendment. It prevents, prevents senators from being accountable to their voters on the great issues of the day. And this is, of course, why it's done. It's not time. That has nothing to do with it. It's not done because the majority leader does not want to have his colleagues vote. Our majority leader has used this tactic, filling the tree 80 times already. To put this in perspective, the six previous majority leaders filled the tree only 49 times combined. Senator Reid has filled the tree on 30 or more, more occasions than the six previous leaders combined. In so doing, it denies the citizen of each state their equal representation in the U.S. Senate. But Majority Leader Reid, in his effort to protect his conference from casting difficult votes in order to assure and uh, in, uh, in, uh, shield them from accountability has essentially closed the amendment process. He has shut down one of the most important functions that senators exercise to represent the interest of their constituents. Recently, this tactic manifested itself in a dramatic way. To the surprise and shock of many, the December spending agreement contained a provision to cut the lifetime pension payments of current and future military retirees including wounded warriors, by as much as $120,000 over, the over their uh, retirement period. Other senators and I uh, have had many ideas about how to fix this problem, but we were blocked from offering them by the majority leader. I tried to offer an amendment to replace the cuts by closing a fraud loophole used by illegal immigrants cited by the Department of Treasury to claim billions of dollars in free credits they're not entitled to. Billions would more than pay for this. But Senator Reid and his conference members, save one, one broke ranks, stood together to block my amendment from a vote. So I would ask my colleagues, are you comfortable with this? Do you have, do you like having to beg and plead with one person to, for the right to offer an amendment in the United States Senate? Do you believe the Senate should operate according to the power of one man? This ominous bill, though it restores pensions for our heroic wounded warriors, leaves more than 90% of those cuts in place. Shouldn't we be allowed to offer amendments to provide a fair fix for all our warriors and veterans? But blocking amendments is only one of the many abuses. The erosion of the Senate has also been front and center in the budgeting process. We are now in our fifth year without adopting a budget resolution. We went over four years without the Senate even passing a budget uh, as required by plain law in the 1974 Budget uh, Act. But instead, taxpayers' dollars are being spent through a series of late-minute negotiations and legislative pay caps uh, that are driven through uh, the Senate. Then we face a massive omnibus bill. This 
an 83-page monstrosity. It's rushed to passage without any amendments or meaningful review. The American people have no real ability to know what's in it or to hold us, their elected representatives, accountable. And that's, of course, why it's being done. Today, the Senate and House are considering another omnibus bill, one that will spend more than a trillion dollars with thousands of items of government spending crammed into this single legislative proposal. The bill will be sped through under a threat of government shutdown with very little debate and no ability to amend. If you don't accept what's in the bill and vote for it and pass it, Senator Reid says, I'll accuse you of blocking the bill and shutting the government down. You don't dare vote no. So it's another way that we must pass it to find out what's in it. My staff and I have had less than 48 hours to digest this behemoth, but already we found provisions that would not survive if considered in the regular order where you have uh, amendments. How is the process supposed to work? Each year, Congress is supposed to adopt the budget resolution. The law requires it. Then, based on spending levels contained in the budget resolution, individual committees uh, report 12 authorization bills. I serve on the Armed Services Authorization, authorization Committee. Based on the expertise and experience of members serving on those committees, they authorize spending. Senator Levin is our Armed Services Chair. Senator Inhofe is ranking member. Senator McCain is on there. These are people who've given years of their life to understanding the challenges of uh, military matters. Then the 12 subcommittees of the Appropriations Committee are to produce appropriations bills for their, for their area of the budget, such as defense, homeland security, and agriculture, which are to be individually considered debated and amended on the Senate floor. And so they actually appropriate the activities that the authorization committees authorize to be funded. That's the way the process is supposed to work. So this gives each member, when the uh, appropriation bill hits the floor, and their constituents a chance to review and analyze each part of the budget and offer suggestions for saving money, improving efficiency, and better serving the taxpayers. That's the way it's supposed to work. The budget pro but under the tenure of Senator Reid, the budgeting process has been totally mismanaged. We've ceased consideration of appropriation bills altogether, basically relying more and more on autopilot resolutions, continuing resolutions, and catch-all behemoth spending packages, like this one. In fiscal year 2006, for example, every single appropriation bill was debated, amended, and passed in the Senate. Look at it, 2006, uh, every one was passed and considered and voted on in here. And that was good. That's how better than we've been doing in the previous years. There were spotty uh, failures during the previous years. Um, but in 2013, here we are here. Now, the red is, uh, indicates that no bill was passed in the Senate. In 2013 and again in 2014, none were individually passed. They were all all the funding was done as part of this omnibus process. So I want every, my colleagues to look at this one more time. The green shows that the bill was brought forward out, uh, uh, to the floor and was passed. The yellow says it was brought forward out of committee but not passed on the floor. And the red says it wasn't even brought to the floor or, or brought out of committee to the floor to be considered. And you see how the red has continued in the out years? What's happening today, colleagues, is contrary to good policy, 
It's contrary to the whole idea of what a Senate and a Congress ought to be doing, and we've got to stop it. I know uh, we've had a lot of frustrations lately, but that does not excuse this trend. It's got to end. Uh, in my first year as a senator, uh, not, and, uh, 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 98, uh, the second year I guess I'm a senator, every bill was passed. Every bill was passed in 2000. Uh, 10. Um, but we've just gotten away from that completely. It can't, we can go back to that. It's not impossible. So those bills, and when I first came here, were all debated and amended on the floor and went to conference with the House to settle our disagreements, and then a bill was sent to the President for his signature or veto. Over time, however, that's happened less and less frequently to the point that nowadays uh, we don't debate appropriations bills of, at all. And look, Senator Mur uh, Murkowski uh, is a great leader in the Senate and one of the people I admire greatly. Um, and, and, and so uh, uh, Senator Shelby and others. And how we got into this process, I don't know. But I would just say this. I think it's fair to say that Republicans have clearly advocated for bringing the bills to the floor and having debates on them. I, as ranking on the Budget Committee, have clearly advocated we process a budget like we're supposed to do. But it's Senator Reid has made the decision, backed by his conference, to not bring these bills up. And it's a political decision. It's a decision to avoid having to take votes on disputed questions of what ought to be funded and what ought not to be funded. That's the problem we're in. So we've crammed all of this appropriations into these, this huge, huge bill under threat of government shutdown. A more ominous development, however, is the breakdown of the appropriations process in the Senate and how it's infecting the House, the House of Representatives. And it's spreading like the plague over there. In the first year of their majority, the House uh, passed, uh, worked and passed and marked up six appropriations bills of the 12 and sent them to the Senate, but the Senate didn't consider a single one of them. Last year, the House passed eight appropriations bills and sent them over to the Senate. Again, the Senate didn't act, refused to consider them uh, individually. This year, the futility of the House's efforts began to show as the House passed only four bills. Why should they pass them and send them to the Senate if it's not going to be considered on, on the floor in a normal, regular order? So they're beginning to erode what they've been doing. All of us, both parties, have a responsibility to reverse these trends. All of us have the responsibility to return to regular order. It's in the national interest. It's the right thing to do. All of us owe our constituents an open, deliberative process where the great issues of the day are debated in full and open public view. Each senator must stand and be counted on these issues not hide under the table and avoid being held accountable. The democratic process is messy, sometimes contentious, and often difficult. People disagree. But it is precisely this legislative tug of war, this back and forth, which forges a national consensus. While secret deals may keep the trains running on time in the short run, they also keep the train, uh, sometimes they keep the trains running in the wrong direction, a direction different than what the American people would like to see. Sometimes it hides bad spending, bad appropriations, bad legislation that ought to be exposed in the light of day. Secret deals rush through without public involvement only deepen our divisions, delay progress, increase distrust, 
and make it harder to achieve the kinds of real reforms that the American people have been thirsting for and demanding. Having to cast many votes on tough issues really does clarify those issues and what the differences are amongst us. I believe that process, I truly believe, openly conducted, can lay the groundwork for more progress than we have today and reduce contention. It will clarify facts and then lead to the finding of common ground. Only through an open legislative process can we create the kind of dialogue, the kind of debate, and ultimately the kind of change necessary to put this country back on the right track. I'm going to continue to work to restore the regular order. I really believe it's important. I respect my colleagues. I'm hearing more and more of my Democratic colleagues expressing these same concerns, and I think there's some unease uh, at the extent to which um, this process in the Senate has been undermined. Uh, maybe, maybe we can make, make progress and, and return to the great open debate and regular order that has made the Senate the, uh, the uh, wonder of the legislative world. Thank the Chair, and we yield the floor. And note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Madam President, Senator from Maryland, I ask that the unanimous consent that the call of the quorum be vac vacated without objection. Madam President, what is pending before the United States Senate uh, is something called the Consolidated Appropriations Bill. It's consolidated because it consolidates the work of 12 separate subcommittees. As the chair of the full committee, uh, I also chair a subcommittee called Commerce, Justice, Science, which I'd like to say what we did in our bill to advance, really, the protection of the United States uh, in terms of federal law enforcement, uh, important domestic violence programs, but also we promoted trade and new ideas in science, and I'd like to share what we did. But before I do, I want to explain many people don't understand the difference between the Budget Committee and the Appropriations Committee. The Budget Committee gives us the macro picture, what should be spent in discretionary spending, mandatory spending, like veterans' benefits, which I believe ought to be mandatory, and also what our tax policy should be. Senator Murray of Washington State led that effort. We passed that bill uh, in April. We tried to go to the floor, but there was objection, I mean, go to conference, but there was objection to it. Finally, after three weeks of shutdown, we were able to get a budget, and this committee's job was given the, uh, the job after the budget was passed to do the work of the Appropriations Committee. The Appropriations Committee takes the work of the Budget Committee and puts it in the federal checkbook line by line. Now, I'd like to elaborate on that but I know that the general lady from New Hampshire has come to the fore, one of our newer members of the committee, but she's not new to good government. 
She comes to the United States Senate with an incredible background serving New Hampshire, particularly in the executive branch as governor. She brings a sense of what government can do, but that Yankee frugality that uh, New Hampshire is known for. So, Madam President, I'm going to yield the floor at this time uh, so that the gentlelady from New Hampshire may speak. Madam President. Senator from New Hampshire. Thank you, Madam President, and, and thank you very much to the esteemed chair of the Appropriations Committee for your kind words and especially for all of the work that you have done to get us to this point um, where we have an appropriations bill before us. Uh, I know that you have worked very hard with Ranking Member Shelby, with the House Appropriations Committee Chair Hal Rogers and Ranking Member Lowy. Um, and it that is really your leadership in reaching an agreement uh, on this bill to fund government for the rest of 2014 and to do it in a way that will support job creation, economic growth, and our national security. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. As you point out, I am a new member of the Appropriations Committee. I'm currently the chair of the Legislative Branch Subcommittee. And so I also want to thank Senator Hoven the ranking member of our subcommittee. It's been a real pleasure to work with him to draft the subcommittee work for the legislative branch subcommittee. Now, for New Hampshire, this bill includes funding for the continued development of the new KC-46A aerial refueling tanker, which we're very proud. It's gonna be the first round of those tankers are gonna be based at Pease Air National Guard Base in New Hampshire. It also makes investments in the new military construction project at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And we're very proud in New Hampshire of both Pease and the shipyard because they play a very important role in our national defense. And these strategic investments are going to create jobs there, they're gonna boost the state's economy, and they're gonna support our men and women in uniform. I'm also very pleased that this omnibus bill in front of us funds the Beyond Yellow Ribbon program. This is a program that connects servicemen and women and their families with community support, with training, and with other services. And as we look at the men and women coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, Yellow Ribbon has been a very important program um, to help reconnect those returning service members to their community. It's also been very important in New Hampshire. Um, we have many of our National Guard and Reserve who have returned from duty overseas and that Yellow Ribbon program is critical. The legislation before us also funds the complete activation of the Berlin Prison, just as it funds the Bureau of Prisons. In New Hampshire, that funding is gonna allow us to get to a full complement of about 340 local jobs in northern New Hampshire, very critical to the northern part of our state. It's gonna provide a $40 million annual boost to the economy in northern New Hampshire. And I'm especially appreciative to the chairwoman of the committee and all of the members for the effort to help the fishing men and women in New Hampshire who have just been devastated by declining fish populations. The bill authorizes $75 million in disaster relief for those members of our fishing community, so many of whom have had their whole livelihoods taken away from them. And this disaster relief money is going to help them during these difficult times, help them to recover, to rebuild what I believe is one of the most critical economic sectors still in New England. It's one of the oldest, certainly. I'm also pleased that this bill reverses some of the reckless cuts from sequestration. And instead, it makes important investments in the future of this country, in our education, in infrastructure, in science and innovation. And yet it also makes strategic cuts. For example, one of my favorites in the bill is that it prohibits taxpayer-funded expenditures on oil paintings for public officials. This is an idea that Senator Coburn and I have been working on over the last year, and I think it's exactly the kind of government spending that we need to get rid of. Um, it sends a message, a signal. Even though it's not a lot of money, 
it's symbolic for the public to know that we're trying to address anything that we can and this is one piece that we can agree on and hopefully it will lead to others. The bill also requires all federal agencies to become, become better stewards of taxpayer dollars because it invests in inspectors general and agencies across the federal government. And inspectors general help those agencies better identify waste and cut spending. Now, while making smart cuts, the bill also invests in priorities like science and innovation. It provides more funding for medical and energy research and development. Um, very important efforts that are underway at the National Institutes of Health. They're finally going to see some relief in this bill. And it supports education, including funding programs like Head Start that have been cut under sequestration. Head Start has been cut in New Hampshire, and it's particularly important because the more we learn about the importance of how children learn, the more we understand how critical early childhood education, programs like Head Start, are to their future development. The bill also makes infrastructure investments, something that we have been too far behind on in this country. So it's going to help us as we look at rebuilding our nation's deficit in roads and bridges and creating jobs. Now, as we all know, and I know the chairwoman would readily admit, this bill isn't a perfect bill. Um, but the legislation before us is a product of the kind of bipartisan compromise that we've got to have more of in Washington these days. And while I'm very pleased that the bill addresses military retirement cuts for some retirees, for um, survivor widows, survivor benefits, and for the disabled, um, we still need to keep working until those cuts are repealed entirely for all military retirees. And it's something that I've introduced legislation on and I'm going to continue to work on. And I know there's a commitment from so many of us here in the chamber to address that. I also am going to continue working to provide full funding for the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, LIHEAP, which helps seniors and low-income New Hampshire families pay their heating bills especially during these cold winter months. This bill makes a small increase in that program, but unfortunately it's not enough to address the challenges so many families in New Hampshire and in the cold parts of this country are facing as we continue through this very cold winter. Now, small businesses in New Hampshire have not forgotten that during the shutdown, they face uncertainty and declining revenues. Federal employees in New Hampshire struggled to make ends meet while being furloughed. And that shutdown, a completely manufactured unnecessary crisis, cost this economy $24 billion. Well, I think in talking to business people around New Hampshire, around the country, that one of the most important things that this bill does is it takes the prospect of another manufactured crisis off the table. It puts in place a responsible plan to grow this economy, to create jobs, and it takes away the uncertainty that has so plagued families and businesses across this country. I had the opportunity this week to meet with the head of the business roundtable. And one of the things he pointed out to me is that we are seeing right now the lowest percentage of private investment in our economy than we've seen in a very long time, in decades. And that one of the most important things we can do in Washington is to provide the business community some certainty so that they will make those investments because that's how we create jobs. Um, we, need, we need to put people back to work. And I think this legislation goes a long way to creating that certainty, to helping say to the business community, to helping say to those people who are unemployed, um, we're going to keep working on your behalf. We're going to try and make those investments and make sure we can create the jobs to put you back to work 
to keep this economy strong and growing and to keep this country competitive. So in closing, I just want to say to my colleagues that now is the time for us to build on this bipartisan success that we've seen that the chairwoman has been able to accomplish with all of her other negotiators. We have this opportunity to build on that to further promote job creation and economic growth. And our country needs us to work together on behalf of small businesses, on behalf of the middle class, on behalf of families. We need to pass this bill. We need to keep working together and address the challenges this country faces. So I urge all of my colleagues in the Senate to support this bill. I yield the floor and again thank the chairwoman for her efforts. The gentlelady from New Hampshire is really generous uh, with her remarks and uh, I'm going to just respond by saying a few things. First of all, and the way you speak about New Hampshire is the way I also speak about Maryland. And when people think about government spending, they think it just goes out in the ethers and doesn't generate anything. As the general lady has said, um, what is spent by the federal government really creates jobs in the private sector. You spoke about the prison. First of all, we appreciate New Hampshire's willingness to accept a prison. Many states don't want them, uh, shy away from them, or afraid of them. New Hampshire has uh, really met a national need, and we know that the staffing that will be provided by the exceptional patriotic work ethic of the people of New Hampshire will keep our country safe. But those same guards, the same admin staff, will be out in their community um, spending money on housing at the local grocery store, maybe needing a wedding planner, whatever. And so that's one area. And the other, in terms of New England fisheries, for those of us who are coastal senators, we know what that means. Fishing and seafood is part of our history, and it's actually part of our state's identity. I think for we in the Senate, the coastal senators uh, have kind of an affinity with each other for it. But again, for what we do, it's those jobs in the private sector that uh, So we want to thank you for what you've done. And also, I just want to comment that the subcommittee on legislative affairs that you've chaired also you know, it's not like it funded legislators. It funds things like the Capitol Police, who are standing sentry here doing their job. So thank you for your work, and we're really so pleased to have you on the committee. Thank you very much. Would the Senator yield, Madam President? Senator from Florida. I just want to take this opportunity, Madam President, to thank the two senators present right there. Uh, in America's space program that potentially was on a downward slope, the two of you all have crafted a budget and appropriation that will keep us with a very robust American space program, including the first A in NASA, which is aeronautics. Uh, from science to the new big rocket, its capsule, Orion, to the commercial, to the unmanned program exploring the heavens, you all have got it right. And I wanted to take this opportunity to express my profound thanks that on the authorization that we built on starting three years ago, you all are continuing the dream. Thank you very much. Well, I thank the gentleman from Florida. Uh, it's, a, it's just wonderful for both my colleague and Senator Shelby and I to receive that you're an astronaut senator. And to come from an astronaut senator to say you think you are doing the job right uh, means a lot to us. The Senate has been blessed by having three, senator, uh, three astronaut senators. Uh, senator Jake Garn, uh, a Republican from Utah. Uh, senator John Glenn uh, of Ohio. 
and Senator Bill Nelson. Now, some of us have been in orbit a long time, but you actually knew what you were doing. So thank you very much, and we're trying to add gravity to this bill. Madam Pre President, I, I, just, from Alabama. I just want to pick up on what Senator McCoskey was talking about. Senator Nelson has not been not only an advocate for the space program for NASA, he is, most of everybody knows, has been up there. And I was traveling with him one time, and I believe we were over Asia, and he was showing me from the plane. We couldn't see as well as he could from you know, rotating the, but uh, I was very impressed. But he has been a stalwart in the space program, the advancement. And we both worked hand in glove with him. And I do believe this is pretty good appropriation considering where we are. And I'm hoping we're going to get back to regular order as Senator Mikulski has advocated and I have advocated. And this is a big step today. We're hoping later today, maybe, we could vote this bill out with a vote like the House did yesterday. Thank you. Madam President. Senator from Louisiana. Madam President, I'm pleased to come to the floor today to follow up on my uh, uh, very uh, eloquent remarks uh, from the Senator from New, uh, New Hampshire and following up on the ranking member and chair uh, woman that are here today to offer a few comments about the appropriations bill. But before I do, I want to thank the chairwoman and the ranking member for really being a great inspiration to all of us. Um, amidst all the controversy and dust-ups and toxic atmosphere and nonpartisanship that's going on, it's our lack of cooperation that's going on, it's wonderful to see the two of them working so closely together um, on a bill that's so important to the country. Uh, and as the great senator from New Hampshire said, this is a bill for the people, for jobs, for our economy. It sends very positive signals across a breadth of industries that the federal government is stepping up to be a more reliable partner in these public-private partnerships that are represented in the funding of this bill, whether it's building our highways, building our space program, funding our Department of Defense, um, sending money to cities and counties that are doing all sorts of innovative and remarkable things with community development block grant funding with a lot of private partners. So contrary to popular belief and contrary to some things you might hear on the radio and television these days, the federal budget does a lot more than fund the government. <laughs> It does a lot more than funding government employees. It's sending out millions, literally millions, of green lights to small business contractors, to large businesses, saying, let's go. The yellow light was blinking a few days ago. The red light has been on for the last couple of years. This bill literally sends out millions of blinking green lights saying, get to work, let's go to business, let's build highways, let's build levees, let's build a space program, let's invest in the middle class, and in addition, I want to say how proud I am of Senator Mikulski's leadership, that she's managed to do this within budget constraints. This is not a free spending bill. This is a smart spending bill within constraints so that we're also mindful of reducing our debt over time, mindful about paying down our bills. So that's what's so really remarkable about this and why I'm going to be so proud to support it. And I hope we can get as strong a vote as the House did on this bill to show strong bipartisan support because while it does address our debt and our deficit. Uh, it does so in a smart way with investments in things that we've agreed on really make a difference to the private sector. And I can tell you in Louisiana, this is going to have immediately positive effects. I want to highlight a few of those now in, in terms of the Homeland Security Bill, which I am um, proud and uh, happy to be the chair of the um, Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. And I want to also say that I've worked very closely with Senator Carper 
my colleague who is the chair of the authorizing committee, uh, and our ranking members, Senator Colburn um, and Senator Coates, as we authorize stronger parts of Homeland Security and then fund some of those initiatives. And I'm going to hit the highlights of just three or four. One of them is the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard is in our Homeland Security Bill. It is a very important component um, of our government. It's one of the most popular components of our government, popular broadly by business and by people. Of course, very popular <laughs> with the people that the Coast Guard has saved <laughs> you know, from drowning or from wrecks uh, in, in our open seas, but also for the hundreds of companies and businesses that have contracts with the Coast Guard to provide some really cutting edge shipbuilding that needs to go on in this country. And the senator from Alabama knows this, senators from Mississippi know this, the senators from Maine, the senators from Louisiana. We've lost a great deal of shipbuilding in our country to other countries. It is important that we keep as much shipbuilding here through the Homeland Security Bill and through the Defense Bill here in America. Ships made in America, ships serving Americans, providing really good, solid jobs. And I am proud, uh, along with Senator Cochran's tremendous support, who is a member of my committee, and Senator Begich, particularly from Alaska, uh, who fought very hard for a good outcome on the Coast Guard budget, which is um, above the administration's request and uh, has a modest um, increase um, and will be supporting so many important uh, projects for our Coast Guard and the men and women of our Coast Guard. It provides $10.2 billion uh, overall, which is a significant um, increase, and we did so within our budget constraints. Another piece I want to highlight is our enforcement of immigration and custom laws. We are in a big debate about immigration reform and the importance of finding common ground on immigration reform for the benefit of our businesses and our economy here in America that depend on clear rules of the road, clear processes for people to become citizens who have paid their taxes, uh, that have come here legally, and for people that are here without the current legal papers to give them a path to citizenship once taxes are paid, once they get in line behind people that have come here legally. And protecting our borders is an important component of that. And in our bill, we have put the resources necessary behind enforcing uh, those uh, tough immigration uh, standards and requirements. So we are protecting our border providing resources for the bill, and that is important to many people in this country as well as people in Louisiana, both to have a, 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 an immigration system that makes sense, but to also provide appropriate jobs and uh, labor to come in and help with so many of the jobs that we have uh, in Louisiana today. We also um, had a focus in our bill, uh, Madam Chair, I think you'll be happy to hear this, about stepping up an additional 2,000 customs um, officers at our airports. Now, we've got an international airport in New Orleans. We get a lot of international travel. We may be a little city, but we fight way above our weight, and our state does when it comes to international travel, because we're a very um, sought-after destination, and we're very happy about that. But there are other states like New York and Nevada and Chicago that have international travel, and even to your state, North Dakota, which is a smaller state, but you're seeing a tremendous amount of business coming into your state, both domestic and international, because of your oil and gas jobs and your energy sector jobs. Well, what a howdy-do it is to arrive at our airports coming to spend money in our country to hire people here or to work with businesses here or to partner with businesses here to create jobs and you have to wait in line in customs for five hours. That is no way to greet <laughs> um, businessmen and women bearing gifts of investment and money for our country. So I've taken a really strong leadership position on this with the travel 
and trade organizations, both in hospitality and in international business. I want to thank their coalition for fighting really hard to make sure that this bill reflects the fact that business is global, it's international, our business people are out and in all the time building wealth for America and hopefully the world, but for America. And business people come in here to help create wealth and help our middle class to grow. And having customs agents that operate, lines that are shorter, most certainly help that and keep our country safe, but also keep it open for business. And people in Louisiana, as a trading state, we're a big port state, we understand trade, we understand international business, and I'm happy to be able to fight hard for those priorities. I want to mention just two other issues. Many committees are working on uh, cyber security. Uh, Homeland Security does not take the lead on cyber overall. The Department of Defense and National Security Agency does, but when it comes to securing uh, our government and our government private sector partners, Homeland Security does take the lead. And we have stepped up some investments in cybersecurity. As a senator from Alabama most certainly understands in his leadership role, this is a real threat, not only to our government, to the Department of Defense, to our government as a whole, but to many businesses in America private large businesses, medium and small, that are feeling the effects of these uh, saboteurs and attackers. And the government has to stay focused and well invested working with the private sector to make sure that our defenses and our security is up and our bill recognize that. And finally, something close to my heart and close to my home is the funding for disaster relief. I hope no one ever has to go through what we went through along the Gulf Coast for Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. I know everybody's had terrible storms and floods, but there has never been a storm or disaster like this, and I pray to the Lord there will never be another one after it, before it or after it. The damage that was done in dollar amounts, the, the damage that was done across a vast stretch of land from Alabama to Texas, the devastation that it caused in numbers of homes and businesses lost is just unparalleled. Now, Sandy was a terrible superstorm, and because the Northeast is more dense than we are down south, they lost more homes technically than we did, but the dollar damage is still far exceeding in the aftermath of Katrina and Rita. But whether it's Sandy on the east, or whether it's floods in North Dakota, which you all have had your share of, or Colorado, or whether it's storms on the Gulf Coast, we have to be ready with money to send immediately when people need help. Now, I'm going to say this because it's been a matter of, of argument between some here. When a disaster strikes, I am not going to look for an offset. I am going to look for the Coast Guard and FEMA to show up with the equipment they have to help people who are either drowning on their roofs or watching their houses burn to the ground. I'm not going to look for an offset. So as long as I'm chairman of this bill, we will have money in this bill to use on an emergency basis when emergencies occur, as they do fairly regularly, unfortunately, in the states that we represent down on the Gulf Coast. And it's just because we're right in the middle of that hurricane alley, these storms are getting bigger and more fierce, and we've got to be at the ready. Now, we helped Maryland. We've got money in for Sandy recovery, and there's money in here still for the ongoing recovery. It's phasing out now on the Gulf Coast, but there's still some projects that are working through uh, even nine years after Katrina and Rita. So let me just say that it's been a pleasure to work with uh, my colleagues. I want to thank the members of my committee, particularly my ranking member, Dan Coates, uh, from Indiana. And I really want to thank uh, Senators uh, Baggage and Senator Cochran for their great work with the Coast Guard and, and helping um, me negotiate this through the process. 
And again, I think these are just some of the highlights of our bill. Nothing would have been possible without Senator Mikulski and her determination to get the green light on because people in my town, in my state, are tired of yellow and red. They want to work. They want to go to work. They want to build, you know, buildings and build roads and, and get projects underway. We've got lots of permits pending that the money in this bill will allow to be released and to go. So I'm proud to vote for it. This is all about jobs, economic competitiveness for America, and good jobs for Louisiana. And I'm sure every senator, um, or almost every senator, will say the same thing about this bill, because it was well done, job well done, and I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Wyoming. Madam President, I rise today to again express my great disappointment about a matter of importance to Wyoming and many other public land states that have not been properly addressed by this omnibus bill.